was, we were in Colossians 1, and the thought was, uh, Him we proclaim, and we kind of focused on Jesus, and, and as I was getting ready for this morning, I realized that they're basically doing a similar thing. We're just going to back up in Colossians 1. So we're going to be in uh, Colossians 1 this morning. Um, but before we get there, um, I wonder, does anyone watch football? <coughs> You yes, got football sir. fans in there? Yes, sir. Yeah, I'm a Dallas Cowboys fan, so I'm, I'm sorry, bro. Yeah, I mean, it's like, it's like, it's like, it's like, it's for real. Um, and it's, it's real, it's tough. Uh, so now I have basically no interest in the Super Bowl, but I still watch it. Uh, but listen, one of the most infuriating things about watching football, right, is when you're, you're watching these, like, million-dollar salary guys uh, do something wrong that I know I could do, right? Listen, I know how to catch a football, okay? And I see these guys drop a pass. Yeah. You're like, come on, like I could do that, right? So, real quick, just if you want to know how to catch a football, if you've never been taught or you need to teach somebody, I'm gonna tell you real quick, all right? This is how you do it. You put your hands up like this. All right, y'all do it. I want to make sure you got it. All right, put your hands up like this. All right, you can take your thumbs and you put them together. And you can put your fingers like this. This is called the diamond right here. Okay, guess what goes in the diamond? No, football. Football goes in the diamond, right? Um, and if you do that, you're going to catch the ball, okay? Except that's not entirely right, okay? We've we missed something first there, all right? The diamond is a for real thing, all right? You try to catch a ball like this, it's going to hit you in the face, all right? You try to catch a ball like this, it's going to bounce off, um, all right? You want to have it like this. The ball goes right in there, all right? But here's the problem. You can have the perfect diamond. Uh, but usually the reason why guys drop the ball is not because they don't have the diamond or their hands like this. It's because they don't have their eyes on the ball. Okay? Golf, basketball, baseball, football, the principle is the same. Keep your eyes on the ball. So you see that ball in. Whoop, you got it right here in that diamond. I mean, here's what happens. You're playing football and you're supposed to catch the ball. You're, it's common to you. you got the diamond, but then you look over there and there's a 300-pound guy about the you. Mm -hmm. So instead of watching the ball, you look over there. And what happens is you get scared, you get your eye off the ball, and then you drop the pass. And then I yell at my TV. Yeah. Um, <laughs> right? uh, it can happen with a 300 pound linebacker, you're going to come smash you. It can happen because you're like, oh, look, there's a touchdown, I'm going to score. And before you see that ball in your diamond, you're looking like, I'm going to be on ESPN tonight. And uh, man, you drop that ball. Yeah. <laughs> what happened, what went wrong was they forgot the first thing. And the first thing was to keep their eye on the ball. So when we're, we're in uh, uh, Colossians, we're going to think through this, this concept a little bit. And, and I wonder if we've been there before. And, and maybe it's not catching a football. Um, but I think there's probably times that we can think about in our lives where and we misordered some things. Yeah. We forgot what was first. Um, Catching a ball, you know, I gotta stop on my TV because it's just a game, right? No, no big deal. It's just a game. I'm gonna be bummed till next year, and then I can start it all over again. Uh, but what happens when we start talking about our families, or our churches, or our relationships, job? When we start misordering some things, if we if we don't get the first thing right, right? You start putting. <laughs> Another silly example, you start putting something together and you didn't read the instructions and then you're left with that one piece. You know, what if this was important, right? You get there and, and it can screw things up. And uh, catching a ball, putting a toy together, maybe that's no big deal. But man, th there can be some severe consequences once we start talking about real life. Yeah. Um, man, the consequences can be devastating. And when we look at Colossians, we start to see the same thing happening in the Colossian church. And, and what happened, just to give you a real quick history here, um, is Paul sitting in jail. He's sitting in jail, and this dude Epaphras comes to talk to him. And he gives him an update about the Colossian church. And he's kind of worried because he's <coughs> like, Paul, listen, the church over there, they're doing some good things. They're loving people. They, they want to follow Jesus. But I'm concerned because there seems to be some false teaching around and, and if you get into especially Colossians 2 and in the middle there and you read the book, you start seeing there's a whole bunch of problems starting to infiltrate the church. And there are people talking about how uh, they were worshiping angels. Some people said that Jesus was an angel. Some people were saying that, well, Jesus was God, but he wasn't really human. And it seemed like there were some other teachers coming in that saying, well, Jesus wasn't God um, at all, although he was a human. 
you see some, uh, some teaching must have crept in the church uh, about how they were taking some of the Jewish rituals and then they were taking them and melding them with some of the Greek philosophy and some of the pagan rituals and it was this synchristic, like we're mixing all this stuff up together and like this was how, what was happening like in the Colossian church. Um, and then there are some people that was probably early forms of Gnosticism where they were saying, well, we have the secret word from God, and, and you have to have some special revelation to really know what it means to follow God. So Epaphras comes and, and tells Paul all of this. And, and the, the city of Colossae wasn't really on the map. It was on the decline, actually. Um, but it's a, a good thing that this happened. And, and the reason why I think God ordained this whole thing happened with this nonsense that was happening in this church was because what Paul writes back is this letter. And what he does is he strips everything away, and he says, this is what you need to know about Jesus. This is what you need to know about what it is to follow God and what God expects of you. And, and what he says is, I'm going to tell you what to keep first. Don't look at these false teachers over here. Don't hear it. listen to this over here. You're going to need to keep this thing first. And basically, the book of Colossians says, keep this first. Um, and so, <clears throat> with all this stuff, you've got the, the, the believers in the church probably confused. And so Paul's like, here's the gospel. Let me lay it out for you. What's the most important thing uh, for you to keep in focus? Um, and so then I think, so fast forward, you know, 2,000 years to us today. Right, this is important for us. Because I think we don't have to look very hard to see some similarities with our culture. Right? You look around at churches and seminaries and Bible colleges, and man, it seems like we might have some misordering of priorities. Um, where you're, we're concerned about, man, are they preaching Jesus or are they preaching something else? Um, they might say have Jesus somewhere in their literature, but man, they're talking about all this other stuff over here. Um, and... and it's worrisome if you're a Christian. But the point for us this morning, I don't think, is to talk bad about all the wrong things that other people are doing. Because we could spend all day talking about how other people are messing this up. So more importantly, I think we want to focus on us. Where's my priority? What do I view as the gospel? Why do I go to church? What's my theology? How do I worship God? Is my worship acceptable? to God. Like, get introspective about our faith, our churches, our schools. Make sure that what we're doing is what's right according to the Word. And so, we start asking ourselves these questions, and we get down to the first question. The question that all other questions hang on. And that's what we're going to try to answer today. Who is Jesus? Who is Jesus? Because that's what the Gospel hangs on. Um, before we get into the text here, one more thing. Um, <coughs> my question, who is Jesus? I mean, Jesus asks his disciples that, right? He looks at Peter and says, I, I, all these people say this, but who do you say that I am? One of my favorite Tozer quotes, um, A.W. Tozer in Knowledge of Holy, he says, um, what comes into our minds when we think about God is the most important thing about us. I think that's absolutely right. And, and listen to what else he says. He goes on and he says, the history of mankind will probably show that no people has ever risen above its religion, and man's spiritual history will positively demonstrate that no religion has ever been greater than its idea of God. Worship is pure or base as the worshiper entertains high or low thoughts of God. So for this reason, the greatest question before the church is always God himself. And the most portentous fact about any man is not what he at any given time may say or do, but what he in his deep heart conceives God to be like. Hmm. So for the next couple minutes here, we're going to open up the scriptures. I want you to be the judge. Who does Paul say Jesus is? Alright, so we're going to start in verse 15. Verse 15, Colossians 1, He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. 
For by him all things were created, in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones, or dominions, or rulers, or authorities. All things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. <coughs> Who's the he in this passage? Jesus. How does Paul describe Jesus? Well, he's first the image of the invisible God. Right, he's saying, um, no, guys, Jesus is not an angel. And no, he's not a created being. You see Jesus, in his own words, who said, you see me, you see the Father. He is the image of the invisible God. Um, and, and, and just for a moment, just consider the magnitude of that statement. Right, who is God? That's a big question. Well, what we know about God is God is spirit. God is outside of our time. God is outside of our physicality. Like, He is incomprehensible. How is our mind supposed to wrap around who God is? We're these little, little tiny, finite creatures. And, and really, we have no hope of comprehending that. But what does God do? God, the word, I guess, in theological circles we use is God condescends. He became a human in the person of Jesus. Why? What does that do for us? Listen, we still can't comprehend who Jesus or who God is, but now through Jesus, we get to see God in human terms. We get to see what God looks like when He walks and talks this earth. We get to see how God responds to human suffering and pain and struggle. So we get to see a little better picture of what God looks like as a man. We have someone that we can relate to, someone who is tempted and tested like we are. And so now, because Jesus is the image of the invisible God, now we get to see God in a little clearer focus. So we take this big, huge, incomprehensible God, and God says, here, this is what it looks like to be God in the flesh. Still incomprehensible, but I think we get a better picture of what it looks like, um, what God looks like in terms of of humanity. So he says he's the image of the invisible God, and then he says he is the firstborn of all creation. I'm like, well, wait a minute. Firstborn, see, he's created. Okay, so no, first of all, he can't be the firstborn of all creation. Okay, he's God, he's not created. So what does firstborn of all creation mean? So it could mean two things. Firstborn is like me. I was the first one that came out of my mom. I'm number one. All right? Um, but the problem is that's really not how this should be taken. And, and the way we should take this is how the first century church would take this. And it's talking about um, inheritance and rights. And what we see is it's clearly um, not about birth order. If you go to, we we'll turn there, but Psalms 89 and 27. Um, God says, I will make him the firstborn. And he's talking about David. I will make him the firstborn, the highest of the kings of the earth. David wasn't the firstborn. So how could God make him the firstborn? Because it's about significance and status and rights. And so God has the authority and the prerogative to say, David, I'm making you my firstborn. And really what he's pointing through is through David, through kings, he's pointing to Christ. And so you see the same thing applied to Jesus. So when, when Paul says Jesus is the firstborn of all creation, he's not saying he's the first created being. He actually reinforces that just in a second here. Um, but he's saying, no, all authority and rights and status and significance are wrapped up in the person of Jesus Christ. Um, so then he continues to say, hey, Christ has the authority as the firstborn. Verse 16, for by him all things were created. So he can't be the creator of all things and a created being. All right. So that's how we know firstborn doesn't mean number one in sequence. It means number one in status. So... Jesus is the firstborn of all creation, but he's also the creator of all things. In heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, he continues on. All things were created through him and for him. So he's saying that Jesus is the first cause of creation, but he's also saying um, that he's the reason for creation. That everything was created for Christ. And then for good measure in verse 17, Paul is saying again, listen, Christ is God. Verse 17, and he is before all things, he is eternal, he is infinite, and in all and in him all things hold together. Mm -hmm. 
So he's the creator, he's the sustainer, he's the firstborn, he holds everything, and everything is for him, and everything um, is due him as the firstborn. Okay? So, what does that have to do with us? Why does that matter? I think really the significance is in the firstborn of creation. God has bestowed everything to Christ. So the question is, I wonder how often we worship Jesus in this facet. Okay? Like, I think sometimes I stumble here because I think of, oh, God, the Creator, and I think of Jesus, the man, and I think of all the good things that Jesus does and what Jesus did for me on the cross. But Paul starts out and says, let's keep first things first. And remember, he's the firstborn of all creation. So that means if God has put him first, we put him first as well. He's the creator of all things. He is the one who is due all of our praise and our <coughs> worship and our honor. Everything goes to Christ. And so the question that I have to ask of myself and I'll ask of you is um, how often have you worshipped Christ solely because of who he is? Only because he is God. Not because of what he's done for you. Not because of what you hope he's going to do for you. Right? But because he is God. Because he is worthy. How do you start your day? Do you start your day saying, God, thank you for the breath of life that you have given me. Thank you for the ability just to wake up this morning for the sole purpose of worshiping you. What would it look like for me and for you, Brooks Bible College, my church, your church? What would it look like to put Christ first before all things, knowing that it's all His anyway? Everything was created for Him. But what if we actually practice that out? And remember that it's purely because He is Christ. Mm -hmm. right? we, we can stop, we can go home, we can just think about that. Right? Yeah. For the rest of the yeah. day, yeah. and be like, I need, I need, let's go and just worship Christ for who He is. And yeah. we can spend the rest yeah. of the time here, and, and maybe we should. All right, but we're going to keep going and finish out this little section here. All right, so He's the firstborn of all creation. Um, but He's also the head of the church. Mm -hmm. right, verse 18, it starts, and He is the head of the body. The church. And like, y'all get it. You're nodding your head. You're like, yeah, Jesus is the head of the church. Um, and, and, and we acknowledge this truth. And we know the teaching. Um, Romans 10, 1 Corinthians 12, Ephesians 5. Like, if you're a member, if you're a believer, then you're part of the universal church. God uses all of us. We're all individuals. Everyone's needed. And we answer to Christ. Like, yeah, that makes sense. We get it. Christ died for the church. Um... Actually, that's the finish of that verse. And he's the head of the body of the church. Why? Again, he is the beginning. Remember, he's God. The firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. We're going to talk about that phrase, firstborn from the dead, next. But why is Christ the head of the church? Because he gave himself for her. Because he bought her with his blood. Um, displaying not only his love for the church, but his obedience and submission to the Father. Um, but if you've been around church for a while, and I assume most of you have, um, we get it. And we're like, yeah, nothing new there. Like, we can move on. But my fear is that we know this in theory, mm. but there's a danger of missing this in practice. Okay, and, and we can answer whether where we are on that scale by just asking the question, well, why do you go to church? Mm. Jesus is the head of church. Why do you go to church? Mm. And I can tell you things about, about why... Uh, why people go to church, right? And, and, and uh, you were mentioning teenagers. Some teenagers come to church because that girl's cute. Uh, I'm going to go over yeah. that, right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> we won't talk about that. But some, um, some people go to church because, listen, they want to be a better person. They want to be a better husband. They want to be a better father or mother or wife. Um, hopefully a better child or whatever. Um, people go to church so they can get fellowship and prayer and community and encouragement. People go to church because, man, they got a good children's program over there. 
Um, they've got so they got a great building and a gym and all that, so I can practice my diamond and catch my football. Um, you know, some people will go to church because man, they got lights and they got music and it's loud and I can feel it and it's awesome. And some people are like, I go to church because they don't have the lights and it's not loud and I can't feel it. And so, and so that's where that's where they go to church. Um, some people go to church because man, they got the best coffee in town and they get free donuts on Sunday morning. I'm trying to get my church on that route right there. Uh, you know, um, but you know, can you guess what what I'm going to suggest should be the reason why you go to church? Jesus. Jesus first. Okay. Some of those things that we just talked about, like those are good things. And that's why you should maybe make a decision about the church or a church that you go to. But the reason why you go to church, yeah. Jesus. Yeah. Keep Jesus first. He's the first reason that we go to church. He is Amen. our head. Amen. So then you got to ask, well, what does that really mean? Because what church doesn't say that Jesus is first? What does it mean for the church to say Jesus is first? I got a couple thoughts. There's probably a lot, but here's a couple things. It means we align our priorities as a church around Christ. Right, so, like, I absolutely want that good coffee and the free donuts on Sunday morning, but I'm going to deal with Folgers and no donuts, like my church does, <laughs> as long as we're preaching Christ. But more importantly, I'm not going to go to the church that has the great coffee and the good donuts if they don't yeah, preach don't Christ. Yeah. Right? So, um, it means that, man, I want our music to be great and our sound systems to be awesome and, and all of that. But we can't let that get in the way of preaching Christ. Like, that's got to be first. Um, the teaching, I want, I hope that I'm relevant and I'm, I'm teaching and I connect with people and engage with people. But my personality can't trump the teaching of Christ. And I'm not going to cater to any individual to what they want to hear. If that means taking Christ off of the position of first in my life or my church and hopefully in the churches that you're attending and, and serving in. So it means we align our priorities around Christ. It also connects with focusing our mission on His mission. Hey, what was Jesus' mission? Well, I came to seek and save that which was lost. Yeah. So I want my church to grow. We can use some more people, but not at the expense, again, of preaching Christ. And, and I don't want our church to grow just so I have a bigger budget, yeah. bigger buildings, nicer stuff. Yeah. Nothing wrong with it. But my motivation isn't to get more people. My motivation is so that more people can hear yeah. Christ right. first. Lord. So they can understand where Christ sits and resides in the whole of the universe, Thank which is you. first. So it means that our um, motivation is found in Him, not us. I want, I want everyone to want to be a better person, a better husband, a better wife, a better parent, a better child. Great. But only if we understand that without Christ first, all that's hopeless. It ain't happening. Keep it first. The motivation is found in Him. So, yeah, I want the great children's program, and I want the good family stuff, and I want the encouragement and fellowship and prayer, but it's got to be centered around knowing Christ first. And then it means we come to serve, not to be Sir. served. Amen. Amen. We recognize that. Listen, as believers, we've been gifted. We're needed in the church, and we have been given as a gift to the church for the church. Um, and I do, I serve him 